Well, I want to welcome you to the city. If you've never been here before, my name's Clayton. I'm the pastor here at the City Church and want to welcome everyone watching online. want to welcome our friends at uh, our Hope City campuses, LCDC and CRTC. We're pumped you're joining us right now as well. And um, man, uh, we, we are finishing our series called Chasing Lions tonight. But before we get into that, I want to tell you about where we're headed, like where we're going uh, over the next month. Next week, uh, we're going to start a new series called Friends, and uh, it's based, it's kind of, the title comes from the, the TV show, and, and so here's what this series is going to look like. We've got some of our friends uh, who are going to be coming in as guest speakers and sharing with us, and I am so excited about that. Next week, uh, a friend of mine who's a church planner in San Antonio, his name is Zach White, he's from the area, but he's since planted a church north of San Antonio in Shirts, Texas, that has exploded, and uh, he's going to come and, and share share with us and challenge us. And then the week after that, uh, a friend of Mark's who he went to college with, his name is Matt Cordova. He's at a church in Panhandle. He's going to come and, and share with us. Then the week after that, you're going to get to hear from Greg McClanahan, uh, who's one of my mentors. And uh, Greg is a missionary down in Southern Mexico on the border of Guatemala, and they are leading a, a movement, a church planning movement that's happening in about eight different countries around the world. And over the last 20 years or so, they, they've seen well over a million people give their life to Jesus through their ministries in these countries. And I've known Greg since I was 18 years old. Many of you, you you've known him, you, you've heard from him before. Uh, you've heard me talk about him. He is going to be uh, speaking to us by video. And so I'm, I'm pumped in week three, you'll get to hear from him. Then in week four, you're going to get to hear from a local pastor by the name of Brad Ingram, who's the pastor at Hillside here in Lubbock, good friend of mine. And Brad was one of the first ones uh, to tell me, Hey, I think maybe God's calling you to plant a church. And so I thought in this series, man, I'd love for him to come and just share with us and, and, and speak to us and, and challenge us as he was one of the ones uh, along with my wife that were the first ones to mention uh, the idea of starting this church. And so uh, this series is gonna be called Friends. It's going to be awesome. Mark told me to do this. And uh, some of you will know what that means. And so you won't wanna miss the series. If I offended you, blame it on Mark. I have no idea what I just did. Okay, maybe I do, but so that's coming up. Also. Uh, this summer, our youth director, Dylan, has got a bunch of stuff planned for our students uh, that are going into the 6th through 12th grade. We'll be emailing you guys about that this week. You'll see it posted all over social media and things like that. So if you're not following us on social media, uh, make sure you're doing that at the city LBK, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then also make sure you're in our system. Uh, so that you get emails from us about what's going on. If you're not, go to the citylbk.church, our website, click connect, fill out our form, and uh, you'll start receiving those email updates from us about everything that's going on. All right, so that's what's kind of coming up. Many of you know too, this fall we're launching Sundays. We're pumped about that as well. And, and so we've got a big summer and a big fall coming, and I couldn't be more thrilled. And as I've said uh, over the past couple of weeks, as we've talked about uh, our Sundays launch this fall, man, I couldn't be more thankful for every one of you that have been on this journey with us this past year. You guys have served, uh, given, prayed, sacrificed, uh, come to church on a Wednesday as we've gotten started and as we've put to things together this past year. And so I'm thankful for every one of you. Let's jump in to Chasing Lines. This is the last week. And let's, let's start with this. How many of you know, don't, don't put your hand up or anything like that, but how many of you know that the outcome of your life is often determined by your outlook on life. The outcome of your life is often determined by the outlook on your life. Like your experience in this life is heavily influenced and impacted by your perspective on this life. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here, here, here's what I mean. Okay. We live, many of you know that right now, my family, we live in a duplex. Okay. It's tiny. We, we sold our house. Uh, it seems like five years ago, it's probably like a year ago, but, but we sold it a long time ago. We've been living in this duplex. It's half the size of the house that we lived in before. And, and so, uh, when my wife, you know, now like a year and a half, two years in, it's kind of like, Hey, it, it's time to, to move. It's time to do 
something different. I'm kind of like, I remind her every once in a while of a picture I took as I was driving into this neighborhood that the sign said about the neighborhood that we live in. These aren't duplexes, they're actually luxury townhomes. And so I sent her a picture of that and said, look, we don't live in a duplex, we live in a luxury townhome. She just wrote me back and said, stop, it's not funny. It's not funny, don't. <laughs> Don't, don't do that. You see, your perspective changes your experience. I feel like I'm good, man. I'm living in a luxury town home. All right. So I'm doing just fine. I told my, my kids, my kids have often wanted a, uh, the, the little, the, the little elf on the shelf. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And uh, it seems like everybody's doing this. Every class is doing this, you, you know, and they come to me and they're like, Hey, we want an elf on the shelf. I'm like, no, no, we're, you know, we're not going to do that. You know, I'm kind of the, the, you know, the stiff church person, you know, that I am religious. I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Christmas isn't about magic and elves and Santa Claus and presents and all that kind of stuff. You know, no, no, we're not going to do that. And they're like, well, all of our friends have one. I'm like, no, they're not. No, they don't. My wife's like, no, actually they do. Like they, they really do. Like all of their friends have them. In fact, they're even doing it in their classes. And so I kept holding out. I don't want to do an elf on the shelf until one day I saw this on my refrigerator. My son Coben had drawn a picture of his own elf on the shelf. If I wasn't going to get him one, he was just going to draw a picture of one so that he could have an elf on the shelf. So he named it Jack and, and, and this is his elf on the shelf. And so some of you are like, so did you get the elf? Yeah, I, I caved in, we got the elf and, and we did it along with the rest of you crazy people. So, so we did the, the elf on the shelf. Now, some of you have given your kids phones at an early age. I've resisted, my wife and I've resisted. We're like, no, 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 you're not getting a phone. I didn't get a phone until I graduate from high school. Uh, so maybe you can get a phone when you graduate from high school. If you graduate, you get a phone kind of thing, you know? But, but they continue to, to pressure us. No, we want a phone, all of our friends have phones. We're like, no, 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 no. all your friends don't have phones. Well, a lot of their friends have phones, okay? And, and so my son, Kobe, though is great at this. He's great at changing his perspective as you can see on the situation and making the best out of it. And so he just drew himself a phone. So here it is. He's got all of his apps on here. If you can see that far. Uh, and then he's got his home button here at the bottom. And at the top, you may not be able to read this, but at the very top, there's only one app on the whole phone. That's got a title to the app. It's the Bible. He wrote Bible on the app. I don't know if he thought I'd see it and think, oh, like he, he does need a phone. Like, and you're probably like, you got in the phone, didn't you? No, no, I didn't get in the phone. And so here's the back of the phone. Check this out. He's got a camera up here. You can see it, okay? He wrote iPhone down here on the, on the bottom. Okay, and then some of you may know what this is. He drew a pop socket. He drew his own pop socket on his paper phone. I'm like, hey, that's a pretty good phone. You got a phone. I don't need to get you a phone. That phone's free. Okay. Then you're not, you, you can't break it. You lose it. It's fine. So Coben is awesome at what I'm going to call reframing the situation, like changing his perspective on his circumstances or on what's going on. He can, he can change his perspective in a way that no one else I've really seen can and make the best out of a hard thing. Now, before you think my kids are deprived or anything like that, okay, they're, they're not, they're doing fine. If they start drawing pictures of food and water and clothing, okay, then we can chat, but they're not drawing pictures of that stuff yet. Okay, so, but my son, Kobe, he, he, he's great at what I'm gonna call reframing the situation, reframing a problem, changing his outlook, changing his perspective on the situation. See, we've been in a series called Chasing Lions. And in this series, what we've said, ch chasing a lion is, is it's stepping into a God-ordained opportunity so that you can seize your God-ordained destiny. And how you respond in those situations, like when you face those man-eating scary lions will often determine whether you step into God's destiny and plan for your life. You can run away, like we talked about last week, or as... The Proverbs tell us we can be as bold as lions. The godly are as bold as lions and chase the lion. They don't run away from the lion. But if you're going to chase lions, if you're gonna be a lion chaser, it means you're going to have to reframe some of the problems and the circumstances in your life. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23. We've been here over the last few weeks, and what we've said is, is facing a lion at face value is not a good thing. It's a scary situation. At face value, it's not 
a good thing. And you could complain, make excuses. You could be a victim or tonight I want you to see you could change your perspective. You could change your outlook by reframing the situation. So second Samuel 23, if you don't have a Bible, go to the city lbk.church and click sermon notes. You can follow along there with us. The verses and everything we're talking about is there for you. So the city lbk.church, but let's go. Second Samuel 23, starting in verse 20, same passage we've been looking at. It says there was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kebzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which including killing two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an opposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors in Israel. I mean, this seems at face value to be a lot of problems that Benaiah was having to face. I mean, he's facing down two champions of Moab. That's, that seems like from the outside, that looks like a, a, a problem. He has a, a lion come upon him. And instead of running from the lion, he, he actually chases the lion down into his pit on a snowy day. Armed with a club, he kills this Egyptian warrior. That, that, that's, that's a problem, okay? But all of these things happen, and he became as famous as the three mightiest warriors in Israel. And then the very next verse, verse 23, says this. And so King David, like King David, the most famous king in Israel, like David and Goliath, that king, King David made Benaiah as a result of all of these things. After this resume, David looks at this resume and makes him the captain of his bodyguard. From the outside, it looks like a huge problem after problem after problem that Benaiah faces, but they're actually God-ordained opportunities so that Benaiah can step into his God-ordained destiny. And so check this out. Here's what I want you to see from these verses. God-ordained opportunities are often well-disguised problems. God-ordained opportunities will often be disguised in your life as a problem. I mean, right before his epic battle with Goliath, David connects the dots. He connects the dots with like his past problems and his current reality and opportunity. David puts two and two together and watch this. Here's what one uh, commentator said about this situation. He sees the way his unanswered prayers actually prepared him for the opportunity of a lifetime. Every time a lion or a bear attacked his flock, David pulled out a stone out of his shepherd's bag, bag put it in his slingshot, took aim and fired. And David realizes in this moment before Goliath that the bears and lions were just target practice. They were preseason games that perfected his skills as a slingshot marksman and prepared him for his sudden death playoff with Goliath. David stands before Goliath and he begins to recount and to remember all the problems he had faced with the lions and the bears in his past and the way that he had responded in those God ordained opportunities. And it gives him the faith and the boldness and the courage to step out in this new God ordained problem and to go to war with Goliath. And so now imagine being David with that as your past, having stared down, having fought the, the bear, the lion as a shepherd, having faced Goliath. And now you're looking at the resume of Benaiah. I mean, can you just see David? Like, I mean, can't you just see, now we don't know this from the scripture, but we can imagine like we can put ourselves in David's shoes and say, look, look at looking at Benaiah's resume and everything that Benaiah has done and say, man, God has been doing something in his life. He's been orchestrating things so that this man could be the captain of my bodyguard. Their stories were almost so in line with each other that David had to be thinking God has been preparing this man with all the problems that he's faced and he's stared down, all the God given and ordained opportunities that he's been through, that he stepped into, he's been preparing this man for this moment to be the captain of my 
bodyguard. I mean, can't you just see, can't you just imagine and picture David putting two and two together? His story versus Benaiah's story. But listen, if you're going to do this, it's nice to do it after the fact. It's nice to look back after the fact and to have that kind of perspective. And many of us can do that. We can look back at our past problems, our past adversity and suffering, and we can look at those things in the past. And sometimes we can see all that God has done since that time and maybe what God was doing and what God has done in me as a result of those things. And it's nice to be able to do that after the fact. But to be a lion chaser, you need to be able to do this in the moment. And so how do we do that? Well, you got to reframe some things. You got to be able to reframe some things and change your outlook and change your perspective in the moment when you face that lion, if you're going to be a lion chaser. And so number one, we've got to reframe adversity. Reframe adversity. No adversity equals no opportunity. No adversity equals no opportunity growth. Adversity is always a blessing in disguise. Now I'm going to share some space nerd facts with you for just a second. Okay. So how many of you know that zero gravity can be hazardous to your health? Like oftentimes when, when astronauts have spent an extended amount of time in space, they lose muscle mass, they lose bone density. And when they come back to earth, they literally have trouble walking because they haven't experienced any adversity. They haven't experienced anything pushing on them and challenging them like gravity or weight. And one thing I've noticed like with kids, and I'm not gonna talk about like an old guy, like kids these days or something. I'm just gonna say like what I've noticed with kids in general today is sometimes they don't have enough adversity. My generation, the generation after me that's coming up, like with my kids, we, we haven't faced the same kind of adversity that the generations before us have faced. And so as a result, there's a lot of ideas and thinking and, um, and, and spoil, like kids that have been spoiled and things like that because we've had so much done for us and we haven't experienced the same adversity that generations before us have. And so we don't have the same ability or strength, mental and emotional toughness that some of our generations before us have had. I mean, here's a great example. Adversity is not getting killed in Fortnite, okay? You just respawn, I think is what it's called. I've never played it before. But, but adversity is not losing or getting killed at Fortnite. That's not adversity. And so one of the things I've noticed, even with my own kids, with my own boys in particular, is that they need to go through and experience some adversity. And, and there's a lot of great places to do that and to get that. But one of the places I saw in my life growing up, and, I, and so we've challenged and encouraged our boys to do the same thing, is in sports. It's just, it's been a great place for guys to experience some adversity, to have other people in your life, like in your face, yelling at you and pushing you and challenging you. That little bit of adversity is healthy. And so we need to reframe adversity as a blessing in disguise. Secondly, we've got to reframe uncertainty. We need to reframe uncertainty. Lion chasers are more afraid of lifelong regrets than temporary uncertainty. Many people have the mistaken notion that faith reduces uncertainty, but nothing could be further from the truth. Faith doesn't reduce uncertainty. Faith embraces uncertainty. Faith is being uncertain, but certain all at the same time. And here's what I mean by that. Faith is being uncertain, maybe in your situation and your circumstance and the problem, but certain in your God. You can be uncertain about your situation, your surroundings, but certain in your God who is able to do more than you could ever ask or imagine. Certain in your God whose nothing is too hard for him, who makes the impossible possible. And so you can be uncertain, but certain in your God and his ability all at the same time. But if we're going to be lion chasers, we've got to reframe uncertainty. Third, we've got to reframe risk. 
We've got to reframe risk. You read through the pages of scripture and you will find one risk taker after another. I I mean, when God has someone who's willing to take a risk, there is nothing that God cannot do in and through that person. Think about Noah. Took a huge risk listening to God, heard from God that he needed to build this ark and he needed to get these animals onto it. People were making fun of him. People were, 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 were condemning him and his family and, and they had never experienced or seen what Noah said was coming. He took a huge risk. And God used him in a powerful Amazing way. Think about Abraham. God told Abraham, hey, you're going to leave your home, your country, everything you know. You're going to leave everything you're comfortable with, and you're going to go to a land I'll show you. And Abraham had to be like, oh, so what land is that, God? And God's like, no, 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 I'll show you. Right. Show, show me. No, no, no. I, I'll show you as you go. No, no, no. Uh, go ahead and show me now. No, no, no. You're going to leave, and you're going to go to a land I'll show you. Like I'll lead you and guide you along the way. You're not going to know where you're going right now. You're going to have to rely on me. You're going to have to trust in me and listen to me step by step. Think about Moses. God tells Moses to go back to Egypt, go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let his people go. I mean, Moses had to be thinking Pharaoh's going to kill me. Go and say, let his people go. I mean, Pharaoh, believing himself to be a deity, could kill me in a second. Go to Pharaoh, go back to Egypt, go to Pharaoh. God, what are you talking about? But he listens to God, he takes a risk, and God uses him to deliver his people, Israel, from slavery. Think about King David who faced down Goliath as we talked about. No one else was willing to go out and face Goliath. No one else was willing to go to war with Goliath. But David, remembering all that God had done in him and through him in his past, said, God will deliver me now. And he took the risk that no one else was willing to take and he fought Goliath and delivered Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Think about Elijah. The prophets of Baal were killing off Jews who would not bow and worship Baal. And Elijah goes up on Mount Carmel and faces down all these prophets of Baal and puts his own God to the test and brings calls down fire and and fire comes down and, and God uses Elijah to bring Israel out of slavery to the prophets of Baal and to idol worship. These guys were risk takers. Think about the disciples. They were told not to speak or preach at all in the name of Jesus or they would be arrested and and beaten, killed, beheaded, and many of them were. Yet they continued to go from city to city and house to house and country to country, teaching and proclaiming the good news about Jesus. They were risk takers. And so God used them and did the impossible in them and through them. They were risk takers. We've got to reframe risk. And so I'm not sure what lion God is calling you to chase. It could mean teaching at a difficult place, starting a business, becoming a foster parent, adopting some kids. It may mean applying to a graduate program, maybe even resigning a position. It may mean ending a relationship or beginning a new one. But one thing is for sure, you cannot remove risk from the equation if you're going to be a lion chaser. And then finally, last, we've got to reframe suffering. And this is the hardest one of all. There's nothing like suffering to derail our pursuit and worship of God. There's nothing like suffering to derail us from chasing down a lion. This is the hardest one by far to reframe Some of y'all heard of a a woman by the name of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom and her family were rescuing Jews and hiding Jews from the Nazis during World War II. 
And they were caught and arrested. Her family went to, suffered in concentration camps and her father and her sister ended up dying in a concentration camp. But her sister, Corey Ten Boom's sister, told her this in the midst of their suffering at a concentration camp where they knew they would probably die. Her sister told her this, there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. There is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. Corey Ten Boom's father and sister died in that concentration camp. Corey Ten Boom survived. And she went on to speak country to country to country, sharing her story, sharing her family's story about the risk they took to hide Jews from the Nazis and the punishment, the consequence that they experienced as a result. And as she would speak, she would work on a piece of needlepoint. And the audience, you, would see the back. If you've ever looked at a back of needlepoint, you just see a mess. You have no idea what's going on. It just looks like a total mess. And so as she would speak, she would work on this needlepoint. And when she got done, she would say, you know, in your suffering, all you can see is the mess. But if you were to look from God's point of view, from his advantage, you would see this and she would turn it over and she would reveal this masterpiece of art. And she would often say, as her sister said, there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. You see, Corey Ten Boom didn't let her suffering go to waste. She turned her suffering into a sermon. And God used her for his glory. What the devil meant for evil, God turned around and used for good. And you know, there's no greater example of reframing suffering than the cross. I mean, if you're a Christian, we, we celebrate and we wear around our necks and we get tattoos and we do all of these things with a cross that was the symbol of execution. It was a symbol of pain and suffering. It was a symbol of bloodshed. The worst form of execution that civilization has probably ever known was crucifixion. Yet the Bible says in Isaiah 58, that through the cross, it was the Lord's will, it was God's will to crush his son. We look at the cross and we look at the death of Jesus and we're think, we must have been thinking or we would think like the disciples would have thought, what, what's going on here? What's happened here? This is a mess. The one we trusted in has suffered and died on a cross, which was known to be the worst way you could possibly die. It was the most shameful way to die. It meant that you were cursed. But from God's point of view, we learned that it was the Lord's will. It was actually God's will to crush his son for him to die on that cross. How could that be possible? How could that be true? How could it be God's will for his son to suffer in that way? It was God's will. It was the Lord's will to crush his son so that he wouldn't have to crush you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and me. It was the Lord's will to crush his son so that he would not have to crush 
you. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took on all the wrath of God for your sin and my sin. He took it upon himself. Ephesians 2 says that by our nature, we are born into sin. In other words, by our nature, we are objects of the wrath of God. But God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay the fine for your sin to die in your place, to be crushed in your place so that you wouldn't have to be crushed by the wrath of God in hell for all eternity. It was the Lord's will to crush his son so that he wouldn't have to crush you. So a symbol of death, because Jesus died on that cross and then three days later rose again, is now to you and I a symbol of life. That symbol of death is now a symbol of life. It's a symbol of the forgiveness of sin. It's a symbol that we've been made right with God that there was nothing that we could do that you could do in order to be right with God because good people don't go to heaven. The Bible says salvation is not a reward for the good things that we've done. Good people don't go to heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough times. You can't try harder or, or do better. That won't cut it. The only way to be saved from the wrath of God is to place your faith in the son of God, Jesus, who died on the cross and took the wrath of God that was meant for you and took it upon himself. And so 2 Corinthians 5 says this, he who knew no sin, Jesus became sin for you and me so that we might become the righteousness of God so that we might be right with God. That's the gospel. It's the greatest example of reframing suffering ever. And so Paul told the Corinthians when they take the Lord's Supper, he said, every time you do this, remember. Remember his blood that was shed for you. Remember his body that was broken for you. Remember the cross, the symbol of death that became for you and I the symbol of life. And some of you here, you've never given your life to Jesus. And tonight's your night. Now is your time to give your life to Jesus so that the fine for your sin, the wrath of God, would be paid for and met in the cross of Christ. And when you give your life to Jesus, the Bible says your sin is completely forgiven. You're made right with God. You're righteous with God. And you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. And so if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, the Bible says, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved from your sin. You will be saved from the wrath of God. And you can know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. And so if that's you, man, just go online. Let us know about that. The city lbk.church, fill out our connect form and just tell us that you're committing your life to Christ tonight. But you know, the hardest thing about adversity and risk and uncertainty and suffering, the hardest thing about those things is that we typically, we often, when we're going through one of those things is that we get fixated on the problem, whether it's ourselves or or someone else or the situation, we get fixated. We lose perspective, we lose focus because we're so fixated on the adversity, the uncertainty, the problem, the suffering, the risk, we get fixated. And nine times out of 10, the answer to that fixation on the problem, the the answer is zooming out. You might think, "How, how, how do I zoom out on my problem? How do I zoom out and reframe the situation and change my perspective? How do I zoom out one word? Worship. Now, Clayton, you don't understand what I've, what I've been through, what, what's happened in my life. The answer is worship. If you're going to reframe your problem, you're going to reframe your, your suffering, your adversity, the uncertainty, the risk. If you're going to reframe, then the only answer to that fixation on your problem, to change your perspective, to change your outlook and to reframe the situation like we've been talking about, to be the lion chaser, you've got to worship. Regardless of your circumstances, we worship. And when we worship, it does a few things. It allows us to zoom out. 
and refocus on the big picture. It allows us to zoom out and focus on the big picture and the big picture is God and his glory. Worship is forgetting about what's wrong with you and remembering what's right with God. Worship restores the joy of your salvation. Worship renews your mind. Worship changes the atmosphere. It changes your perspective. Worship changes your heart. You know, in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are arrested for preaching the gospel had the best intentions, doing what God told them to do. And most of us would say, well, well, they're doing what God tells them to do. So surely they won't have any suffering or adversity or uncertainty in their life. And nothing again could be further from the truth. No, they're doing exactly what God has told them to do. And they are arrested for it. They are thrown in prison unfairly. They're in chains in a dark, prison. And in Acts chapter 16, you don't hear Paul and Silas complaining and whining. You hear Paul and Silas worshiping. But Clayton, they've been arrested for doing what God told them to do. I, I mean, they're suffering for doing what God told them to do. Bad things don't happen to good people, right? And most of us would probably raise our hands and say, no, nothing could be further from the truth. But in the midst of their suffering, being unfairly treated, unfairly condemned, unfairly imprisoned, much like Joseph, Paul and Silas start worshiping. And in Acts 16, it says that the whole environment and atmosphere of that prison began to change and the other prisoners began to worship with them and the jailer comes running in and he's freaking out. He doesn't know what's going on. And because Paul and Silas were worshiping and it changed that entire atmosphere, it changed the, the whole situation around. And that jailer that was, had imprisoned them and was guarding them is now on his knees saying, sir, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have what you have? What must I do to worship even when my situation is terrible, when it's out of control, when it's chaotic? What must I do to have what you have? And they tell that jailer to repent of his sin, give his life to Jesus. And it says that him and the jailer's whole household were saved as a result because Paul and Silas worshiped God in spite of their situation. And so their worship changed everything for them. It changed everyone, changed everything for everyone around them. And it changed everything for that jailer and his family who ended up giving his life to Jesus. So don't let what's wrong with you and your world keep you from worshiping what's right about God. Mark Batterson in his book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day said this, many of our prayers are misguided. We pray for comfort instead of character. We pray for an easy way out instead of the strength to make it through. We pray for no pain when the result would be no gain. We pray that God will keep us out of pits and away from lines. But if God answered our prayer, it would rob us of our greatest opportunities. Many of our prayers would short circuit God's plans and purposes for our lives if he answered them. Maybe we should stop asking God to get us out of difficult circumstances and start asking him what he wants us to get out of those difficult circumstances. And so here's what I want you to see tonight. Here, here, here's our big idea. And as we close this series, here's what, here's what I want you to catch. It's this, is that the outcome of your life will often be determined by your outlook on life. And so to change your outlook, to change your perspective tonight, to see the other side of the needle point, it means worshiping. Worshiping regardless of what's going on in your world right now. And we're gonna do that here in just a second. But before we do, I wanna ask you a question to close this series. Are you going to live your life in a way that is worth telling stories about? 
or are you going to play it safe? Too many of us pray as if God's primary objective is to keep us from getting scared. But the goal of life is not the elimination of fear. The goal in life is having the courage to chase lions for the glory of God. So what lion is God calling you to chase? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I just want you to begin to ask yourself that question in prayer. God, what lion are you calling me to chase? Some of, for you, it's very obvious. For some of you, you're not there yet. And so you need to pray for the courage and the boldness to step into that God-ordained opportunity so that you can seize your God-ordained destiny. Some of you right now, you're in the thick of it. Maybe your suffering, your uncertainty, your adversity has derailed your pursuit of God, your worship of God. It's derailed you from chasing that lion. And tonight, would you just begin to pray, God, Help me to zoom out right now in this moment. Fill me with your spirit that I might have the courage and the boldness to chase that lion once again and pursue you and worship you tonight with all of my heart. And as you are there with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just wanna ask that you would ask for the faith to worship God these next 10 minutes. Let's not worry about tomorrow. Let's not worry about next week or next month. Let, let's ask for the faith to worship God these next 10 minutes. And as we do, I believe God will change our perspective. He'll change our hearts. He'll allow us to zoom out and to see the other side of the needle point if we will take these next 10 minutes and worship God with all of our hearts. So let's stand. Our team's gonna lead us in worship here in just a second. And as they do, I wanna remind you, I wanna remind you of what happened when Daniel was thrown into the pit with lions. Many of you know the story, but when Daniel was thrown into that lion pit, the expectation was that the lions would devour him. They would eat him. They would destroy him. They would take him out. But the next day they come in and they look and Daniel's still alive. And they're saying, "How, Daniel, how did you survive the lions? How did you do it? And Daniel said, it was my God who shut the mouth of the lions. That's why I'm still alive today. And so the king, King Darius says this, all of us will begin to worship Daniel's God because he is the living God. He is the God who shuts the mouths of lions. And God, we worship you because you are the living God. You are the living God that shuts the mouths of lions. You are the living God who fills us with boldness that we will chase the lions that you allow and even bring into our lives sometimes. So God, tonight as we worship, change our hearts, change our minds, change our perspectives. We worship the one true living God.